Awesome. Okay. All right, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jackie Harunian. I'm a family law attorney in New York, and I'm very excited today to have a co-host for a brief presentation that we're going to do regarding the differences in family law in New York and Florida. Uh, my co-host is someone you're gonna love and meet in a second. Her name is Christine Goss. Um, she's a family law attorney and mediator and does collaborative law in Florida. She's in Fort Lauderdale. And we're gonna talk about just a bunch of differences in the process, in laws of child support and custody, laws regarding spousal support and maybe even dividing assets. And something that's relevant to everyone, we're gonna talk about the differences between processes of mediation versus settling out of court versus going to court, because I'll bet there's a lot in common uh, no matter which state you go to. I'm going to quickly put up the contact information in case you want to screenshot this or write down the email address for me or Kristen. And I'm going to put this up again at the end of our conversation. Um, what are the differences in family law in New York and Florida? Um, this is the list of issues again. And now I'm going to share the screen with my lovely co-host, Kristen. Uh, so Kristen, thank you so much for participating today. We both decided this would be a great topic. You and I met through the NADP uh, in a presentation I did, and you reached out to me on LinkedIn. Everyone knows I'm a LinkedIn fanatic, and I've met a lot of wonderful people during the pandemic and before um, that have turned out to be amazing connections uh, to grow our network and so we can share what we each know. So I'm gonna throw it over to you first so you can tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. And then we're gonna talk um, yes. about the differences between New York and Florida. First of all, I wanna say there's amazing differences just between the two states. I go down to Florida frequently. I have a little second home there. My children go down there all the time. My son Aaron is there right now with his wife. Um, so there's so many amazing um, reasons to go to Florida a lot of amazing reasons to come up to New York. And a lot of my clients have moved down to Florida either temporarily or permanently during the pandemic. And that's created a lot of family law issues. I mean, we all know the pandemic has really caused a surge of people to move. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you've noticed. We can talk about other things um, economically, the housing market, but we're gonna focus on legal differences. Over to you, Kristen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, it's a pleasure. So gosh, you, you boosted Florida uh, so much. I was going to say I'm a, a South Florida native, born and raised in Fort Lauderdale uh, my entire life. The first time I saw snow actually was when I went to law school <laughs> in the Four Seasons um, at that. But um, love what I do. Um, love being connected to you, Jacqueline. Um, and just a little bit about myself. I am, as Jacqueline mentioned, a collaborative family law attorney. I am licensed in Florida. I am the managing partner of KWG Family Legal and Mediation Services. I know that's a lot. So I say KWG for short. Um, and my focus areas are prenup, prenuptial agreements, postnuptial agreements, divorce, paternity actions, the whole gamut of uh, family law. Um, as well as wills, trusts, living wills, durable power of attorneys, things of that nature. Um, and so as I would say, as far as New York, I uh, visited New York, I want to say for the first time in college. And so I've been to the city, I've been to Harlem, and then there was a little, and excuse me, this is very ignorant of me, but I um, I attended a training in college and it was in a little country town. I couldn't tell you what the, the city was in New York, but I was shocked because when I thought of New York, I thought of the, you know, New York City and, and but it's very diverse just as Florida. Um, and so for that, I love it. Um, both of my parents are from the South. So uh, I like to have that country, the, the country vibe is, is cool. 
Oh, it's nowadays. very cool. I think New York and Florida have so much in common. I think they are both very diverse and people don't always realize that. New York mm -hmm. has some very, I want to call it red state features and a lot of blue state features and it's known mm -hmm. as a blue state, but it is very diverse. And I live in the suburbs outside Manhattan, about 20 minutes away, um, uh, 22 minutes by train. And so I, I have that big city and, and suburban uh, lifestyle right now. And I went to school in Harlem too. I actually went to Columbia, which was in, is in they called it Spanish Harlem, mm -hmm. um, but uh, love the city, but I appreciate living in the suburbs. I know that you and I have a lot in common. We're both moms. Your children are much, much younger <laughs> and mine are older, which has allowed me to really uh, expand my practice in very exciting ways uh, over the past year or two. But when you were listing your practice areas, I noticed that we have so much in common in that aspect too. I also do a lot of prenups. I do a lot of estate planning and my vision of family law really encompasses planning uh, for financial future of the entire family. So a lot of that is estate planning. It's prenups and postnups and friendly agreements. And my preference is to work out issues with clients peacefully, although I do a lot of litigation as well. So. I thought we would start there before we really get into the different nuances in, fa in Florida law, uh, in family law versus uh, New York. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your, uh, you're really a mediator and you really stay out of court. Can you tell us a little bit of the reasons why you chose that um, as your focus and what that means to you in terms of serving clients? And then I'll Absolutely. go into the litigation because we both do a little bit of mediation too. Go ahead. Absolutely. Um, so my father was a pastor, my mom was a social worker and a veteran. Um, and so growing up, I was introduced to, I, I observed them helping families on a daily basis and I developed a love for helping families. And so at a very early age, I knew that I wanted to, I liked the law, um, but that I also liked helping families, um, and the, I guess, touchy feely aspect of of that and so at the time when I went to law school it was and I, I still think it is um this way but it, it can change um the idea is okay you're going to go to law school you're going to litigate you're going to argue you're going to you know um check all the boxes you're going to go to trials and and I did all of that but I also found it at times to be uncomfortable because I am a lot like my mother in a sense where um, I, I like the touchy feely, you know, the emotions of things and I can separate um, the, the, the law from the emotions, you know. Um, so with that said, I heard about collaborative, unfortunately, after graduating from law school and passing the bar and, and practicing. And at first I was like, oh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I like the idea, but it, it wasn't popular and it's still not as popular in South Florida. Um, but I did attend the training and after I attended the training, I'm like, this is it. This is exactly me, you know, and I think that for any attorney or any professional, whatever you're doing, you have to find something that you're passionate about and something that is going to be you. So you can be your authentic, genuine self. And so it's a comfort thing for me. And it, it, I feel like it's the best of both worlds. Yeah, you know, I love that. So much of what you said really resonates with me because first of all, what I love about family law, and I've been doing it a lot longer than you because I'm much older than you, but uh, I've been doing it for more than 25 years. And what has always stayed with me, despite all the challenges, is that it really is a helping field of law. There is so much social work aspects to it. Just really being there when people need you to listen and provide advice. Um, and a lot of people don't have good advisors in their lives for whatever reason. And when their lives fall apart, they need someone that's going to be there and help them make good decisions. Um, and sometimes it's mental health decisions, like you need a therapist, or maybe you need a marriage counselor, or you need someone to help you with maybe addiction issues. So many things uh, that are, it's a big responsibility as a family law attorney to try to heal a person or heal a family. Um, you know, what you said about collaborative law is so interesting because in New York, in my view, it also hasn't taken off in the way that I think a lot of people expect. And so what I'll explain, collaborative law 
is a is a niche practice that that Kristen practices and a lot of my colleagues in New York do as well. Uh, and one of our associates um, in my office, Jordan Traeger, is trained in collaborative law. It's you make a commitment to stay out of court and to settle out of court using your attorneys. Um, and if you don't settle out of court and the case goes into court, you have to fire your attorney and start over. So it's a it's a really a commitment by the attorneys and by the clients. So um, as I mentioned, I also love to be the peace peacekeeping arm of, of a family law matter. Why I don't do collaborative law, law uh, is because I feel like while most of the time I call myself a zealous peacemaker, I do have a little part of me that's a little bit of a warrior and, and needs to fight and needs to advocate in a very strong way. And for me, that means I wanna offer that to my clients that if mediation breaks down, or the case really goes off the rails, I can file an emergency application and go to court uh, if I need to. And because we have a large team here, we have 11 attorneys, uh, we have a large staff, I can uh, create papers and go in front of a judge within hours. Uh, and I need to do that in some cases because sometimes people will use out of court process, including mediation, and they will use it in bad faith. They will use it to stall, they will use it to hide assets, um, they will use it to take advantage of a party that's not very strong and really wants to uh, resolve things out of court. Uh, and you need to have what's called an even playing field. You need to have both parties that have access to information, access to money, um, you know, making a decision that's in the best interests. And, and sometimes you don't have that. So I, I want to be able to uh, fight for a client if I need to. And a big part of my practice is also helping victims of domestic violence which obviously is everywhere. It's not unique to Florida or New York. It's all over. It's in every socioeconomic bracket. It's in every uh, you know, ethnic and racial community. Um, how do you deal with victims of domestic violence? Do you do, you, do orders of protection? Do you counsel That's, clients on that or no? I do counsel, but I don't uh, represent um, individuals. So for domestic violence cases, I, I counsel, I give advice, and I would refer to colleagues who, who do handle those cases. Yeah, understood. You know, I, I won't deny that litigation is stressful. It is extremely stressful, not just for clients, but for attorneys too. Going into court for litigation obviously means getting a judge involved. And sometimes you need that. As I mentioned, there are times when you need to go to a higher authority because parties are not acting in good faith. But it is stressful. It's extraordinarily expensive. Even now, during the pandemic, where everything is virtual for the most part, it's expensive. When you open the door to a lawsuit and do discovery and serve subpoenas and, and, and are going through a process that can take years, we're talking about ex serious expense. So there's risk in, in that because sometimes one side can afford the process better than the other. And a lot of times people will think litigation is the answer. And, and I will even agree that maybe it's the right strategy, but then they run out of money and there's nothing worse than having to end a relationship with a client because they can't afford to pay you. And so I will sometimes be able to help clients that are indigent, that have run out of money. Sometimes we can make payment arrangements, but a lot of times it really comes to a point where they have to settle and, and have to make a hard choice. And uh, we both know that I'm not sure what the stats are in Florida, but in New York, 95% or more of cases settle before trial. Is it similar in Florida? Yes, it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's another thing. I think it's. I think those are similar stats all around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, people really need to take that in and hear that. I mean, you are going to probably settle your case before a judge makes a final ruling. So why not consider mediation? Why not listen to your lawyers and make those hard choices? Because what it means is, you're gonna to get to move on with your life. And that really is what mediation and out of court processes and collaborative law really deliver. I wanna say hi to my friend, Michelle Kern Rappi, who's a wonderful mediator. I know she's watching because she just left a comment on Facebook. Uh, medi uh, Michelle, uh, I presented her before, is a very high level mediator in the New York City uh, in the Manhattan uh, Supreme Court. And she does mediation in all kinds of cases, not just matrimonial. Uh, she does, uh, you know, multi-million dollar settlements for uh, insurance companies and, and malpractice cases and personal injury cases. And, uh, you know, it's, it's true across the board. If you're not going to resolve your dispute, you're talking about potentially years of litigation. Mm 
-hmm. And honestly, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Um, and, and that really is the truth. It's better to resolve your case. So I'm going to give that point to you, Kristen, as the mediator and collaborative attorney, because that's really your, your practice area. So, so now let's go into different issues um, and the differences between, so you and I, we talked about the differences in New York family law. And the one that jumps out as the number one biggest difference is child support. Mm, in New York, okay. child support extends almost up to age 22 for a married couple. And in Florida, it's age 18. Yes, so can, yes. you, can you comment on that? I mean, that is a huge difference. That is a reason why people might wanna file their divorce case in uh, Florida versus New York. That is a huge difference in how the case will play out. So can you comment on how, what the jurisdictional requirements are, residency requirements? Someone's yes, living yes. in Florida, how long do they have to wait before they file a case? And then I'll comment on that from the New York perspective. Sure, absolutely. So for a divorce, um, it, it's like basically the six month rule. So um, one of the parties, whether it's the petitioner or the respondent has to be a resident of Florida for at least six months prior to filing the petition. Um, now, as far as child support, which you mentioned, it is um, extended until 18 or they graduate from high school. They could be 19, but you know, they have to graduate within that time frame. Um, so that's that. And then in regards to paternity, um, it's a little bit different in regards to the residency requirements. Um, the petitioner has to be uh, a resident of Florida for at least six months prior to the filing of the paternity action. That's, that's incredibly interesting. So I love doing these presentations because I'm a nerd and I love to learn. And so I've learned so much from you already. So New York actually has a one-year residency requirement. So before you file for New York, for New York no-fault divorce or any divorce, one of the parties have to be living in New York State for at least a year. So that means, you know, you can definitely run to Florida, wait out a few months, and then file there quicker. So uh, that's important strategy advice for anyone listening. In New York, uh, the most common grounds for divorce are no fault divorce. So you have to be married at least six months, but there are times when a marriage falls apart within a few weeks or a month or two. And we work around that using other grounds, but also allege no fault grounds because virtually every case is a no fault case in New York, which makes sense. Why would you waste money fighting about the reasons why the marriage failed? There's no defense to a no fault divorce. We call it irretrievable breakdown. Do you have a no fault version in Florida as well? Say that so that's another difference then, because in Florida, no fault is the standard. There is no other standard. Um, so it's very easy to get a divorce, you know, in, in Florida. All you have to do is just say irreconcilable differences is what we call it. Um, yeah. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're headed there. New York was actually the last state in the country to accept no fault grounds. So we were duking it out over adultery and cruelty uh, until fairly recently. Uh, we, it was, it, New York is, is very conservative in that way. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that it took so long to reach us. But yeah, we're headed towards uh, un unanimous no-fold grounds. We're not quite there yet. And, and, you know, that's hard for clients, getting back to the emotional aspects, because uh, it's very hard for my clients. And I've got to say it's mostly women that really have this, this, this uh, you know, resistance uh, when they meet with me and I tell them, listen, we're past the fault. We're now ready to talk about custody and child support. And they're still stuck on the the uh, betrayal and the unfairness and the infidelity. And, and it does take counseling for men and women, for them to really understand that, uh, you know, um, you can't live in denial. This is where we're at. You've been served with papers or you're living apart already. And it's time to talk about the real legal issues. Um, and, and that is hard. And, and I, I wanna really pause and recognize that. Uh, you know, divorce, separation, uh, it's, it's a painful moment for, for, you know, they say it's almost as painful as death for a lot of people. And we can't just jump past it and get into the money. People really do need to work with an attorney or a counselor or a coach that helps them really get through the beginning part, which is always emotional. It's always a roller coaster. And then running to a lawyer and going to court is like throwing gasoline on it, right? Why would you do that? Take a pause, you know, really take in what's happening and, and then um, get ready to make some important legal and financial decisions. So 
Uh, so far, the jurisdiction is different. The grounds are different. The child support is different. Um, so the next topic we're going to talk about is child custody. What are the what's the paradigm in Florida for child custody cases? So we refer to them as time sharing. Um, they don't the the jargon judges don't like custody uh, or uh, saying custody at all. So I'm I'm sure that's a difference. Um, but we are leaning more so towards a 50-50 schedule for um, both parents. And so that's a good thing. Uh, it was not that way uh, years before. So that that's the, the, the shift. I was going to ask you though, um, because you mentioned this is kind of going back to the no fault as far as alimony. And so I one of the factors in Florida, even though we are a no fault state uh, for alimony, if one spouse or the other is asking for alimony, um, fault is something or infidelity is something that is considered, but it's one of like, you know, several other factors. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to get to that. That's, that's actually, we have a similar um, okay. consideration for that. So first of all, jargon is so important. Uh, you know, you and I are both working moms. I couldn't have raised four children without uh, a partner who I'm still married to helping mm -hmm. and I don't mm -hmm. call it helping it's parenting so Absolutely. yes uh, in New York um, the terms visitation are very disfavored uh, although people still use it soul custody is like forget it no one gets soul custody anymore unless we're talking about real extreme situations which do exist mm -hmm. uh, we don't use time sharing we use parenting time so that's the favored terminology but visitation is still uh, used and I, I don't like it I don't like the term visitation, so I'm trying to use parenting time. Um, and joint custody, shared custody, 50-50 custody is for sure a thing now. Moms love it. A lot of fathers are asking for it. And I think children benefit from it. You know, So uh, it does kind of leak into the child support part of the case because obviously there's a negotiation there. If we're gonna have 50-50 custody, what child support really needs to be paid. Um, but I think it's 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 great that we finally have reached this point. It's really equality uh, mm -hmm. and the same for same sex couples. And you're yeah. always gonna have cases where one parent does most of the heavy lifting for parenting because the other parent is traveling or is just not going to really invest in parenting in the same way. But I really think we're at a, a turning point in society, which is equality based, which I really think mm -hmm. is great, especially for working parents. Absolutely. So I think that's something in common uh, and I, all, I really think it's a national movement. Yeah. Do you all have a term um, shared parental responsibility? We do. The word okay. sharing is definitely having a moment, and I think we're seeing it more and more. Okay. Uh, we have decision making, you know, you know, with academics, and I, I'm sure the laws are very similar with custody because families are families, and you know what we're seeing. Uh, as cultural and societal changes, I really think are are pretty universal. You know, marital misconduct can be used uh, as a consideration for alimony. In New York, we call alimony maintenance and spousal support. We don't use the term alimony anymore, but uh, fault is not gonna be used necessarily for the grounds for divorce, but marital misconduct, you know, gambling, wasting assets, spending money on, you know, a, a paramour, a mistress, that, those are always going to be something that will be considered. Uh, but it's expensive, you know, to prove those things. And this really goes back to the emotional component of sometimes one party is really motivated to prove marital waste and marital misconduct. And, and I have to be honest and tell them, you know, again, we're talking about litigation now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's expensive. You really want to pay a lawyer to, to figure out how many credit card charges went to Louis Vuitton for a mistress and <laughs> what was being done five or 10 years ago. In New York, the courts are not very willing to go back that far and do a forensic on the party's finances. If you stayed in a marriage and this is what was going on and that's what showed up on the tax returns, hey, you know, you're stuck with what your, your marital financial life really was because you didn't do anything about it. So I see more and more um, sort of harsher outcomes for women that stay home that didn't really pay attention to the mm -hmm. finances. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're the ones usually that are the most upset and blindsided even when there's a divorce. Mm -hmm. So wow, those are some real differences. Um, wow, learned a lot. Learned a lot today, Kristen. This is so Thank interesting. You. 
Uh, spousal support, we talked about another major difference. Can you tell us guidelines for spousal support or alimony in, in Florida? Yeah, so generally speaking, it's whoever, uh, whether it's husband, husband, wife, wife, um, husband or wife that's asking for it, um, you would have to prove need and ability to pay. Um, and so the, the spouse that's asking for it, of course, has to prove I have the need and that the other spouse has the ability to pay. Um, then, of course, as, as stated earlier, that um, there are some some fault issues or infidelity issues that can be considered um, amongst other factors. And then in regards to um, the amount, of course, there, unlike child support, there is no calculation like, okay, we've been married for seven years. And so this is the amount <laughs> um, or like, let's plug in our incomes into a, a calculator and see how much the alimony would be. There's nothing like that. Um, oh, wow. So, and so interesting. There are different types as well. There's lump sum you could ask for for alimony. You could ask for a bridge the gap to get that person on their feet for a period oh, of time. There's permanent, which is oftentimes granted in long term um, marriages, which is considered 17 years or more. Wow. Um, and then the general rule is alimony can be given to the spouse that's requesting it for half at least half of the marriage that's fascinating because there's a lot of differences with new york and, and there, anyone who's listening who thinks they might have a spousal support issue either for or against uh in new york or florida i think you want to pay attention to this because this is in my view spousal support is the one issue that really leads people into court the fastest because there's almost always a disconnect between what one party expects and what the law is and, and there's an emotional component to it, too, because in a long marriage, especially, you know, you're going to see real differences in what people think they want to pay. And, uh, you know, laid on top of that is now we have a lot of women breadwinners that they have to pay spousal support and they hate it. You know, men always hated to pay spousal support, but but working women for sure have a big issue with it. And so for starters, uh, spousal support, we also call it spousal maintenance. In New York, uh, we do have guidelines. We do have a calculator and it's relatively new. So if anyone's listening, you can actually go on the New York court state website and find a uh, calculator, which where you really do plug in the income and it really is based on income and, and mostly disparity in income. So if you have a, a breadwinner earning six figures and, and the other party is earning 30 or 40 or $50,000, you're going to see a real number pop out on this spousal support calculator. It's really for discussion purposes. There's a lot of reasons why those numbers don't really make sense. In some cases, there are adjustments for child support. Is spousal support tax deductible in Florida? Not anymore. Not As anymore for 20, us either. Okay. 2020. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So the, in New York, it actually changed uh, with the uh, the Trump Tax Reform Act in 2017. And I actually, I'm in very big favor of. That's the one thing I'm in favor of uh, is that he, he really did make uh, negotiations much, much easier. Um, and that tax reform really helped. So it's not tax deductible. So that's one thing we have in common. Uh, but our guidelines are one third to one half the length of the marriage. So, you know, a little bit stingier in New York, which mm -hmm. can make a difference. We don't we don't go with half. It's mm -hmm. one third to one half. Uh, we have the calculator, which provides real numbers. We also don't really have lifetime or permanent spousal support anymore, uh, even in longer marriages. So once you start to reach social security age, that's sort of the ending point in most cases because it's expected that parties will have social security income or retirement assets. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a little bit of a harsher outcome. Mm -hmm. I think New York's laws really favor the moneyed spouse much, much more. Uh, in, in many in many ways. And so the most important thing is for spousal support um, is you have to go to an experienced attorney uh, to really know what the issue is, to really know how the law affects your situation and what defenses you might have against it. Because a good family law attorney or mediator is going to give you a pretty good level of accurate prediction of what's going to happen in court. And there are going to be cases where people will take their chances and go to court 
And sometimes that's a smart move because it creates leverage. Uh, it creates a real reason to really find that middle ground that everyone can live with, which is what good mediators can always help you find the middle ground. But again, I'm gonna go back to spousal support is risky. Litigating is risky. It almost always kind of goes with counsel fees. So if you're gonna fight tooth and nail for spousal support, you're gonna be paying more to a lawyer and there's gonna be more of a reason to ask the judge to make a, a counsel fee award, uh, which, mm -hmm. you know, let's face it, who wants to pay their own lawyer, let alone the other side's lawyer? Mm -hmm. It's risky, it's a risky strategy, but in high income cases, which is really what we're talking about with spousal support, sometimes it's a strategy that works. And so that's a real big difference. Yeah. Um, so, wow, uh, Kristen, we're already at 30 minutes. I've learned so much from you. I think the last issue we wanted to talk about is relocation, which mm -hmm. is huge mm -hmm. now during the pandemic. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit of what's been happening with relocation cases? A lot of them are New York to Florida. Mm -hmm. I've been seeing it in my own client, uh, you know, my, with my own clients. Uh, and then I'll we'll come back to me and then we'll put up our contact information. Absolutely. So, um, the general rule is you cannot move more than 50 miles with the kids uh, without the other parent's written consent. If you don't have the other parent's written consent, then of course you have to go hire an attorney, um, go to court, and or we can resolve outside of court, but oftentimes, unfortunately, for relocation, they're heavily litigated. Uh, you know, if the other party's not agreeing, they're not going to agree really to resolve outside of court. And so um, you would have to, of course, file the petition for relocation. And those uh, are very, very hard in Florida to prove. You would have to prove that it's in the best interest of the kids for the relocation um, and go by the statute and really outline a good case as to why uh, the children should be taken away from having more time with one of the parents. Yeah, yeah, relocation cases are very, very difficult, very challenging, and I'm handling a number of them right now. They almost always end up in court, and they're basically custody cases. And mm -hmm. we, during the pandemic, I've had a lot of relocation issues with teenagers that suddenly decided they wanna spend more time with dad or more time with mom, or because of the pandemic, stop going to one parent's house versus the other. Mm -hmm. Pandemic has caused so much unrest, and. Um, some of it is school related, some of it is medically related. Uh, in New York though, we have a much smaller radius. I mean, no parent could really relocate uh, without court permission outside of a school district without court permission. So that's a very small radius. That could be five or 10 miles. Yeah. And um, I often get that question. A lot of times the moms think that if they get sole custody, they're allowed to relocate to like mm -hmm. Hawaii. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, that's not the way it works. So don't, you're not gonna get sole custody anyway. And even if you do, you can't just move children if it's going to affect the rights of the other parent. And mm -hmm. that could even be a weekend overnights. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have seen a lot of requests for relocation, a lot of them to Florida. And, and a lot of times that means you've got to work out a schedule that makes sense. So is it gonna be that you reduce child support so that the other parent can fly into New York uh, for older children, can they fly alone? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of parents are spending time in Florida anyway, so they don't mind a relocation to New Jersey or Florida or someplace that makes sense. But for sure, it's going to be a negotiation. It has to be in the best interest of children. If the school, school district isn't good, don't even think about relocating. In New York, we have pretty good schools. So you have to really make a case for relocation. And, and it's difficult because par parties you know, uh, they do remarry, they do find new jobs, people do relocate for various reasons. Uh, lots of people want to move to out of New York for various reasons. Uh, although I'm going to comment and say that the New York housing market is super strong right now. A lot of people that moved out of New York in the beginning of the pandemic have moved back to find out that it's impossible to find a place to rent now or a place to buy because the prices are super high. We are having a boom, thank God. Uh, you know, even though the Omicron is causing Broadway to kind of uh, and, and some restaurants to close and some concerts are being canceled. But New York is really roaring back. And I'm very happy because that's really good for everyone. Um, and this is a very good feeling. And I'm, I'm definitely you can see my New York side. I've been a lifelong New Yorker, even though I don't live in New York City. I'm, I'm right on the border. And it's, it's very nice to see that the economy is bouncing back in various ways. So um, 
I think that's this is a good place to end it. Uh, maybe we'll have another conversation about changes. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, optimistic news for families. Uh, I, I want to close by saying that my heart is with family law. I know yours is too. I think that's why we connected. Absolutely. And, you know, transition and change. Um, you know, and is part of life. It's part of relationships. And anything that people can do to have what I call a courageous conversation, sit down with someone you love and talk about changes that need to be made. There is always a way that you can transition um, relationships and, and make decisions that are in the best interest of children if you work with a professional that really gets that and wants that for you. And certainly Kristen, you have that, you are a peacemaker, you're a daughter of a social worker and a pastor. I can see that that's where your heart is. And, um, it certainly, uh, even though I do litigation as well, I really do encourage people to work out family law through mediation or settlements out of court whenever possible. And, and with the right advisor and the right professional involved, you can definitely do that. And more people should consider that. I'm going to give closing remarks to you, Kristen. Thank you so much for doing this with me. It is going to be on Facebook Live. And while you give your closing remarks, I'm going to put up our contact information one last time. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you, Jacqueline. This was phenomenal uh, to all of you out there. Um, please feel free to reach out to Jacqueline or myself. Um, in New York, Florida, we have this, this New York, Florida thing going on. I'm looking forward to connecting again uh, with you, Jacqueline. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, this is great. My pleasure, and I want to say thank you to the NADP and Vicki Townsend for connecting us with her wonderful organization. Uh, and thank you to LinkedIn, all my friends and colleagues on LinkedIn for all those great connections and keep them coming. Thanks so much, Kristen. Have a wonderful day and happy new year to you, your loved ones, and everyone who's listening. I really hope all of us have uh, a peaceful uh, 2022 with peace of mind in whatever form that takes. Be yes. well, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.